this candle as a reminder that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and walks with us each and every day. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to this time and this place and this space of worship. Welcome to this time for us to come together as community, both here in person and virtually online. We are so fortunate that we are able to gather as the body of Christ here now today. This is our time and our place and our space of worship. We belong here together. And as we gather to share in this time of worship, let us pause to remember that we worship on lands that are by law the unceded land of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. Our announcements are in uh, the announcement pages that you guys have uh, been able to pick up. They are also printed on Facebook and have been sent out in emails and delivered to folks who still are unable to come and join us in person. So if you look, um, start at the beginning, uh, this Tuesday and Wednesday there is filters in the parlor, um, and if you are looking for a mask, they do have masks there, they have a surplus supply, and if you would like to get one, please contact either Ebby or Maureen, or go in on Tuesday or Wednesday, and they're three for ten dollars. We have um, worship, let's see, looking ahead. We are gathering uh, today and next Sunday, August 11th, August 11th, <laughs> I'll wake up eventually, August 1st, and uh, then services will pause for the month of August, and then we'll resume on September, Sunday, September 12th, and we'll have our Back to Church celebrations on Sunday, September 19th. Included. Uh, also, um, summer worship. So traditionally, it is our tradition to worship with St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church when we have our church uh, closed for the summer. They didn't join us for July. You might have noticed that. Their minister, uh, Reverend Gail, she um, joined their congregation uh, during the pandemic, and she just wanted to have this time to worship with them. So they've been worshiping all July over there. She's going to worship all summer. So she, they will be open in August. And if you would like to join them, uh, their families sit in bubbles in their pews. And the pews are marked where you can sit and where you can't sit. So it's, it's very visible for you. Uh, everyone has been using the hall door over there. So if you want to go in, you can go in the hall door. But if for some reason you decide to uh, go in the front door, it's open too. Uh, just to let you know that most people now are going in the hall door. Um, so yes, we are welcome to join them for August for worship. But then you're going to notice on this yellow sheet that there's a whole bunch of other in-person and online worship services that are also available to us. Um, the United Church Ministerial Group, we've been meeting um, throughout, uh, both in Zoom and in person when we're able to throughout the year, and we were talking about summer worship, and some of the other congregations don't have a, a sister congregation like we do. They don't have that ability to go to other another congregation right across the road when they need to. So they have opened up their uh, online worship to us, and we've opened our online worship and personal <coughs> worship to them if they've been off in July. So if you wanna look or check out any of the other United Church congregations, uh, online or in person, all their information is there, and, uh, and you are more than welcome to join them at any time. So, what else do I have here? The dates are set for the second annual indoor yard sale, which will be held on two different Saturdays, both three different Saturdays. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I should read ahead, right? On three different Saturdays, Saturdays, August 21st, the 28th, and September 11th. So, please put those things aside. You no longer need for, and then uh, offer them for the sale. Drop-off times. Uh, so, think times where you can drop off stuff for the, for the indoor yard sale will be Wednesday, August 18th, and 25th, and September 8th. 
and the drop-off time is from 5 to 7, and I would, I would check the bulletin just to remind yourself of those. If you have donations to make but are unable to deliver them on those days, please contact Pamela. Her contact information is there, and they will make arrangements to meet you at another time. And we thank you for everyone who is uh, dedicating their time to both working uh, with the yard sale, gathering stuff for the yard sale, and all of the different uh, many jobs that are involved in planning and making that happen. If you'll notice, there's there's a, a good amount of information on Mission and Service 2020 to thank, uh, there's a thank you for our help, uh, for our Mission and Service givings, and then also information on what happened with all of the Mission and Service givings in 2020. And uh, I think it's all really good stuff to take time to read and to know how far our Mission and Service givings uh, impact the world. And finally, I think, I have, we have a birthday. Jack White, oh my goodness, Jack, you're turning six today. That's so exciting. Six, oh my goodness, that's really exciting. You're getting so big, that's wonderful. So happy birthday, Jack. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, we can't wait to see you again soon. Uh, is there anything else coming before the community at this time? Hearing nothing, then let us join together in our call to worship that is printed on the screen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, and life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Oh God, we come to worship today. We come to this time together with you seeking rest, seeking hope, seeking consolation, seeking encouragement, seeking peace and happiness. This is our time to come together as one in the Spirit. We worship in the Spirit of Jesus Christ who calls us to be the church and to celebrate God's presence in the world. We come seeking to be in the same mind of, as Christ our Lord, who makes our joy complete and teaches us to do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility to regard others as better than ourselves. Be with us now, O oh God, as we consider these things, as we work to follow your ways, as we work toward your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering has been received. Our offering has been brought forward. Our off offering has been gathered in so many different ways. And, and uh, it's been wonderful uh, that we continue to regard the ministry and the mission of St. Paul as important and vital in our community and beyond. And so for that, we are thankful. Let us pray. We bring our gifts to you, God. Here is the work of our hands and here is the love of our hearts. Accept them and use them through Christ our Lord. Our opening hymn is, Let Us With a Gladsome Mind.
pray. Oh God, let us prepare ourselves to be touched by the witness of your scripture. Our hearts and our minds are open. Amen. So, I bet you were expecting to see Mark up there, because that's what we've been reading. Uh, but no, today the lectionary takes us in a different direction. The lectionary brings us over to the Gospel of John to tell today's story. Um, it is a familiar story. It is a story that is in all four Gospels. It's a story that we've heard time and time again. Uh, it's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And so today we're going to tell it from the Gospel of John's point of view. The Gospel of John is a beautiful gospel. It's often referred to as a poetic gospel because there is a lot of poetry in the Gospel of John. It, uh, it tells the story of Jesus' life in a very specific way. And it's a little bit different than the way the other three Gospels tell it. And the Gospel of John tells the story of John in a very specific way because it's building. Each story builds on the last. And it keeps building and building to, kind of, to, to this climactic point where it reveals Jesus as the Son of God, as Emmanuel, God with us. So here we are in sort of these building phases in John chapter 6. Uh, what's been happening is, is Jesus has been preaching and teaching uh, throughout the countryside, and he has his disciples assembled, and they have been learning from him. But he continues to teach them while at the same time ministering to the people and having compassion for the crowds that are following him. So this is one of those stories where the crowds are following, and they're in need. And Jesus is there to provide for them, and while providing for them, is teaching the disciples what it means to be followers of Christ, what it means to be the body of Christ. So we, as disciples, listen to this story intently to find out what it means for us. So let's listen to the story from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. I printed it uh, in bold print today. Um, because this story in my Bible, I'm going to show you just because it's funny. Um, I love this much. This is how much I love it. Let's go to it. Let's go there. It's written all over. <laughs> and so I didn't want to lose my little notes that I had written all over this story because I really love these notes. So I thought, you know what, I'll just, I'll just print it on a piece of paper. So that's why I'm reading the paper today. Also, it's easier to read when it's a nice bowl print. Once this had transpired, Jesus made his way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which some these days call the Sea of Tiberias. As Jesus walked, a large crowd pursued him, hoping to see signs and miracles. His healings of the sick and lame were garnering great attention. Jesus went up a mountain and found a place to sit down and teach. His disciples gathered around. The celebration of the Passover, one of the principal Jewish feasts, would take place soon. But when Jesus looked up, he could see an immense crowd coming toward him. Jesus approached Philip and said to Philip, Where is a place to buy bread so that these people may eat? Jesus knew what he was planning to do, but he asked Philip nonetheless, he had something to teach, and it started with a test. Philip said, I could work for more than half a year and still not have the money to buy enough bread to give each person a very small piece. Andrew, the disciple who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, I met a young boy in the crowd carrying five barley loaves and two fish. But that's practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. They all sat together on a large grassy area. Those counting the people reported approximately 5,000 men, not including women and children, sitting in the crowd. Jesus picked up the bread, gave thanks to God, and passed it to everyone. He repeated this ritual with the fish. 
Men, women, and children all ate until their hearts were content. When the people had all they could eat, he told the disciples to go gather up the leftovers. Jesus said, go and collect the leftovers so we're not wasteful. They filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves. After witnessing the sign that Jesus did, the people stirred in conversation. And they said, this man must be the prophet God said was coming to the world. This is our gospel, according to John. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is Bread to Share. Spirit of God, descend upon us, making our hearts an altar in your love the flame. Amen. So, we're reading um, from the Bible every week, right? We, every week we have scripture readings and we read scripture. And, and I think sometimes we forget, um, I know I do, that we're reading ancient literature, that this is, the, the biblical literature is an ancient form of writing, that this was written thousands of years ago. I mean, we, we read things differently that were written hundreds of years ago, like when we were in high school and, and we took Shakespeare, we had to do whole courses on how to read Shakespeare because it's, it's such a different way of writing. In the world and it's a different way for us to understand this type of literature so so biblical literature is like 
thousand plus years older than that. So it's, it's really, really old. And um, I think we need to come at it with respect. And because it's written in this different way of writing than what we're used to, um, we can find sometimes that it doesn't do what we want it to do. Um, this uh, type of writing lacks a lot of details. The details of the story um, aren't there. And it can seem a little simplistic sometimes, but actually it's quite sophisticated uh, because what it does is in one word or one phrase, it's linking you back to previous words and previous phrases and previous stories. And so all these details really matter. The, the bread and the story really matters in this story. But because it lacks details, we often want to impose our own ideas on it. Um, it, it kind of makes me think about, um, so if you ever had the chance to read Lord of the Rings, it's big, it's a big read. Um, Tolkien wrote these books, this, this, uh, these stories in such rich detail that you could read a whole page and it will just describe to you what a tree looked like. Like it's, it's so very detailed and, and, and then you'll read another page. And so then people don't talk very often. Like Gandalf says a line and then there's a whole bunch of description about what the world looked like and what the scene looked like. And then maybe Frodo says a line. So there's very, it's very, very rich in detail. And, and on the opposite side of that, there's a book that Sean and I read uh, in the early 2000s, I think 2006 it came out, called The Road. It's by Cormac McCarthy. And it's just, it's just talking, basically. There's very little detail about what the scene looks like or what's going on. There's, there's the odd paragraph that will describe uh, what the scene is like, but it's mostly conversation. So it actually reads really quickly. I read it in a day. Both of these books have been made into movies. And when you go and you go to a Lord of the Rings movie, if you've read the book and you see what the Hobbit house looks like in the movie, you go, well, that's exactly what the Hobbit house looks like. Because Tolkien did such detail in his writing that there's no way for us to misinterpret what exactly this house looked like in his imagination. And so when we reproduce it, it looks exactly like the house. But The Road was also made into a movie. But it looks nothing like what I imagine. When, I, when you see the movie on the screen, the characters, the scenery, they look kind of familiar, but they don't look the way that I imagined them. My imagination built this world in a different way because it was free to do so. And that's kind of like biblical literature. It, it doesn't give us the details like Tolkien did. It more leaves us to our imagination. But there's a problem with that because we can then make it what we want, right? We, it, we can make it the world that we want it to be uh, because we can use our imagination to work freely with it. If we don't do the thing where we go back and read and reread it deeper, so the biblical literature develops over time. We're not supposed to get it the first time we read it. We're not supposed to get it the second time or the third time. We're supposed to read it and read it and read it again. It's called meditative literature. That's the type of literature that it was. And you read it over and over again. You read it and you reread it our whole lives. This is what we're supposed to do. And every time we read it, we see some more. And I write another post-it note. <laughs> and we see some more, and we see some more. And we come at it as different people. That's the other really interesting thing about Scripture. It is a passage that I read when I was 20. I came at it as 20-year-old Mary with my worldview that I had when I was 20 and the life experience that I had when I was 20 and the place where I was living when I was 20. But now when I read it, I'm, um, I, I come at it with a different worldview. I come at it with different experiences. I come at it with um, a different level of reading of the scripture. I've read more and read more and read more. So it changes how we read it. It's called um, 
the, the word for this meditate is to mutter or speak quietly. And so if we quietly read scripture aloud and talk about it and ponder it and read it and reread it, when this happens, um, it becomes our story. We become steeped in it. We become part of it. Uh, this past week, I had the wonderful privilege of being the chaplain at Camp Getty for a couple of days, and it was delightful. I was there uh, with the seven-year-olds. They're so wonderful. And, uh, and I really thoroughly enjoyed my time there. And one of the things I really loved about it uh, as chaplain was being able to interact with them as they did Bible study and as they did worship and as they made out their day. So at Camp Getty, the way you begin your day is you begin with um, flagpole. So everyone goes to the flagpole, we sing in Canada, we raise the flag, and then as the chaplain, I lead us in prayer and read scripture. But then, rather than tell them what I think of this scripture, rather than tell them what I think is happening, I ask them a question. And then everyone turns around and sits down and quietly thinks about that question for 20 minutes. For 20 minutes, seven-year-olds and 15-year-olds who are the people leading and, and other age groups all just sit quietly and think about the scripture that was just read and the question that was asked. And I think, what a great way to read and encounter scripture. And we have a tool very similar to that, that, that we've practiced here before. It's called Lectio Divina. It's a, 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 a way of praying and meditating the scripture. And it's a way to slow down and encounter scripture where it is. Um, I read an article not that long ago about the fast pace that we had been leading up to the pandemic and then the slow pace that we have been encountering and this idea of intentionally living slowly, intentionally taking a slower pace to, to slow down to get more out of the things that we're experiencing. So I thought we could just try a little bit of that today. I, in, in Lectio Divina, there's like this, this method of doing it where um, you prayfully uh, ruminate, take time and, and think about the scripture. And we do it by reading it and then reflecting on it. So you read it and you listen for a word or a phrase that, that, that jumps out at you. As you're listening to it, you go, oh, that really spoke to me. And then you meditate on it and you think about how this touched my life. So rather than me giving you a question about it, like I did with the, with the camp, you form your own question. You listen to the scripture and you think, where, what phrase spoke to me? And then... Think about that and why that phrase spoke to you. What image or idea came from that? And that's the meditation part. And then we just rest in it for a minute. We just sit there and, and, and just rest in it. You don't have to do anything at this point. It's delightful. We just rest. And then, what is my response to this? How do I respond after this encounter with God? with this encounter with scripture? How do, I, how do I respond with my day and my week and my year after, after thinking about this and resting in this and meditating on this, where do I go now? And that's just the movements of Lectio Divina. Normally, we would read through the scripture three or four times, but today I'm going to read through it twice. I'm going to read it slowly, and you can close your eyes, and you can just relax, and listen. And as you're listening, listen for a phrase or a word or a question for yourself today. And then think about it. Rest in it. And then how are we going to respond to that? So relax. Rest in the word. And I will read you the word again 
from the Gospel of John. I'm going to read it through completely, slowly, twice, and then we'll have a, a little bit of silence, a little time to rest in it, and then we'll end in prayer. Once this had transpired, Jesus made his way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which some these days call the Sea of Tiberias. As Jesus walked, a large crowd pursued him, hoping to see new signs and miracles. His healings of the sick and the lame were garnering great attention. Jesus went up a mountain and found a place to sit down and teach. His disciples gathered around him. The celebration of the Passover, one of the principal Jewish feasts, would take place soon. But when Jesus looked up, he could see an immense crowd coming toward him. Jesus approached Philip and said, where is a place to buy bread so these people may eat? Jesus knew what he was planning to do, but he asked Philip nonetheless. He had something to teach, and it started with a test. Philip replied, I could work for more than half a year and still not have the money to buy enough bread to give each person a very small piece. Andrew, the disciple who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, I met a young boy in the crowd carrying five barley loaves and two fish, but that is practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. They all sat down on a large grassy area. Those counting the people reported approximately 5,000 men, not including the women and children, sitting in the crowd. Jesus picked up the bread, gave thanks to God, and passed it to everyone. He repeated this ritual with the fish. Men, women, and children all ate until their hearts were content. When the people had all they could eat, he told the disciples to gather the leftovers. Jesus said, go and collect the leftovers so that we are not wasteful. They filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves. After witnessing this sign that Jesus did, the people in the crowd stirred in conversation, and they said, this man must be the prophet, God said was coming into the world. Once this had transpired, Jesus made his way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which some these days call the Sea of Tiberias. As Jesus walked, a large crowd pursued him, hoping to see new signs and miracles. His healing of the sick and lame were getting great attention. Jesus went up a mountain and found a place to sit down and teach. His disciples gathered around. The celebration of the Passover, one of the principal feasts, would take place soon. But when Jesus looked up, he could see an immense crowd coming toward him. Jesus approached Philip and said, Where is a place to buy bread so these people may eat? Jesus knew what he was planning to do, but he asked Philip nonetheless. He had something to teach, and it started with a test. Philip replied, I could work for more than half a year and still not have the money to buy enough bread to give each person a very small piece. Andrew, the disciple who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up 
and said, I met a young boy in the crowd carrying five barley loaves and two fish, but that is practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. They all sat together on a large grassy area. Those counting the people reported approximately 5,000 men, not including the women and children. Sitting in the crowd, Jesus picked up the bread, gave thanks to God, and passed it to everyone. He repeated this ritual with the fish. Men, women, and children all ate until their hearts were content. When the people had all they could eat, he told the disciples to gather the leftovers. Go and collect the leftovers so that we are not wasteful. They filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves. After witnessing the sign that Jesus had done, the people stirred in conversation and they said, This man must be the prophet God said was coming into the world. God, we thank you for this time that we've had to read and reflect and to rest in your word. And we ask ourselves, what is our response to what we have heard? What are you saying to us today? And how will we live it out? As we, as we wrestle with these ideas and with your word for us this day, we pray for your spirit and your strength to guide us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we now have, uh, I think, a special treat. I heard this song earlier and I was very excited about it. And Stephanie and John are going to sing it for us now. Stephanie found it. It's wonderful.
You should know, though, that, that the original version had puppets. So you did miss out a little bit. Maybe next time. <laughs> it was lovely. Thank you guys so much. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes we don't feel like we know how to pray. But we take comfort that the Spirit intercedes with us with sighs too deep for words. That you, O oh God, know the meditations of our hearts and the cares and the concerns we sometimes feel we cannot speak. We thank you for the world and all that's in it, for the sunrise and the warmth it brings, for the rain and the light it gives, and for the ways you nourish us and sustain us, O oh God. And today, O oh God, we pray for the needs of the world. Sometimes it feels like there is injustice at every turn, and we can feel surrounded, we can feel overwhelmed. So many people that we love are in pain in body, mind, or spirit. So many more we do not know yearn for healing and care. No, God, we ask that you pour out your healing spirit upon them and make us agents of your blessing. Your own beloved body is broken in pieces and scarred by wounds that do not heal. So instill in your church the desire to be whole and make us one with one another, that we may worship you in unity. For all those, O oh God, with burdens carried in secret, and for our own needs, we pray. Our hearts and our hands and our voices are yours. Increase our faith, sustain our hope, and send us out to do your work and show your love. God of compassion and caring, we pray silently for those that you hold in our hearts this day. Source of all light, we praise you for the wisdom of your word and the hope of your promises. To all your saints on earth and in heaven, we commit ourselves to the dawning of your new age. And we pray together as we are taught by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So let us go out to the world as people who are reading Scripture, as reading it, meditating on it, contemplating it, praying with it, that we are people spending time in the stories of scripture so that they become our stories and we become changed by them so that the world can see Christ reflected through us and our actions. And we do this with the love of God, peace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.